and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here today for our panel on uh, evaluating the Trump presidency at midterm. We have three distinguished speakers joining us today for this talk, and so um, I'm going to make the introductions, and then uh, we're going to have a slightly different format since one of our speakers uh, just published a book last fall, Mr. Trump's Wild Ride. We're going to ask uh, Mr. Major Garrett to begin our session by talking about the research in his book as well as his current coverage of the White House. And then we'll bring our Calico Center fellows up for our uh, panel discussion. And of course, we'll have plenty of time for audience questions. We have a lot to talk about today. So I will keep our introduction, my introductions brief. But I do have to say a few words of welcome. Uh, we are delighted to see our students here from the American Presidency course, uh, Dr. Himmel Himmelfarb's American Presidency course, my uh, public policy and public service class. We have uh, members for our, pu our public policy external advisory council. And we have a special guest today, uh, another presidency scholar here, Dr. Lara Brown, who is the director of the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University, uh, the author of a book about jockeying for the American presidency, the political opportunism of aspirants, and many other publications. Um, we're delighted to have you here with us today, Professor Brown. So thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll begin by introducing our uh, presidential fellows and then Major Garrett. Um, our Calico Center senior presidential fellows, Howard Dean and Ed Rollins, are longtime experts in American politics and in uh, participating in educational events at Hofstra. Howard Dean, of course, is a former Democratic National Committee chairman, US presidential candidate, governor of Vermont, and practicing physician. He's currently a senior strategic advisor and independent consultant for the government affairs practice at Denton LLP, an international law firm. Uh, Governor Dean transitioned in 1982 from medicine to elected office in Vermont, where he served as governor for 12 years before running for president in 2003, where he implemented what at the time were innovative fundraising strategies, including use of the internet. As chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Governor Dean created and implemented the 50 state strategy and the development of 21st century campaign tools and is widely credited with helping the Democrats make historic electoral gains in 2006 and 2008. You may have seen in yesterday's news that Governor Dean is now uh, heading a new data exchange operation for the Democratic National Committee that will involve sharing voter data among the national party, state parties, and independent political advocacy groups. And we're very glad to have him with us today. Mr. Ed Rollins is a veteran political strategist and communications expert in American politics and actually does quite a bit of uh, uh, work in uh, interna uh, advising international political candidates as well. Mr. Rollins managed former President Ronald Reagan's 49th state landslide reelection victory in the Electoral College in 1984 and has had major managerial roles in at this point, close to a dozen other presidential campaigns. Mr. Rollins has served in the administrations of four US presidents, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush, including two tours of duty as assistant to the president, the highest staff appointment in the White House. In the Reagan administration, Mr. Rollins directed the White House offices of political affairs and intergovernmental affairs, and he served as deputy chief of staff during President Reagan's second term. He was also the first non-member of Congress to serve as chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee. Mr. Rollins uh, it was inducted into the American Association of Political Consultants Hall of Fame, and he currently heads the Great America Super PAC. So thank you for joining us, Ed. It's good to have you back. Our guest speaker today is CBS Chief Washington Correspondent Major Garrett, who is a longtime uh, journalist covering the White House since the administration of George H.W. Bush, so that was on the Capitol Hill side, and then covering the White House from, I think I saw uh, on one of the bios, inside the gates from Bill Clinton up through Donald Trump. Um, Major, I'll 
say more about his book in a minute, but Major Garrett is a journalism and political science major, so uh, something that we are, those of us from the School of Communication and Liberal Arts and Sciences are delighted to see. Uh, after covering local news in Nevada and Texas early in his career, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he started as the congressional reporter and then the deputy national editor for the Washington Times. He became uh, moved from there to television to become White House correspondent for CNN and then went to become chief White House correspondent at Fox News, where he worked for eight years. After Fox News, he became chief White House correspondent for the National Journal, a uh, position in which he covered the 2012 presidential debate at Hofstra University. He uh, then became chief White House correspondent and then most recently chief Washington correspondent for CBS News. In addition to his daily reporting, which many of us see um, on the news every evening, and I was very interested to see, Major, that uh, you don't use a teleprompter, that you memorize everything you say, which was, uh, which was very nice to, uh, to see. He's also the host of a weekly podcast for CBS called The Takeout, uh, where he meets with uh, na national political officials in a Washington restaurant and they talk about politics. He's also the author of three books, including one that I used in graduate school with uh, former uh, Minnesota Congressman Timothy Penny called Common Sense. Um, he's published a book, a published a book in 2005 called The Enduring Revolution about the Republican ascendancy in national politics. And then most recently, last fall, <laughs> is the author of the book we have before us, Mr. Trump's Wild Ride. And um, he will, I think that is uh, connected to a roller coaster uh, imagery, and there is a lot to share there. So we will, uh, you'll have an opportunity to see the book after the panel if you're interested, but for now, please join me in welcoming Major Garrett. Mina, thank you very much. It's great to see all of you here. I'm very pleased to see the crowd. I um, want to say a couple of things about the book and my day-to-day -day life covering the, the Trump White House, and I'll do that by means of a story. But first, before the story, let me just get a, you to raise your hand. If you've been to the dentist and had your teeth cleaned, raise your hands. Okay. About six months into covering the Trump presidency, I went to my dentist and had my teeth cleaned, and my dentist is a Humanist, you know, he tries to minimize pain and he instructs all of the dental technicians to go easy, but they still use that particularly wicked scraping device to carry out their work. And I was there in the chair and while my teeth were being scraped, I fell asleep. And my dental technician had to wake me up. He said, Mr. Garrett, I need you to, you know, not fall asleep because I need to keep your mouth open. And it occurred to me that one of the consequences of covering the, what I call in the book, the daily cyclonic spasms of the Trump White House is I found the scraping of my teeth sufficiently relaxing that I could go to sleep. <laughs> I think that says it all right there. Um, it's one of the questions that might arise this morning will be, how, is this different? Oh, let me just get that out of the way. Yes, it's different. Um, the daily rhythms really don't exist as compared to the previous three presidencies I've covered. But I also want to emphasize that to declare that the Trump presidency in many respects is different is not to declare that in every respect it is wrong or necessarily injurious. That things are different doesn't necessarily and always make them wrong. They can make them shocking. They can make them give us a feeling as a country and individually of being out of balance. There may be, and we can have a lively discussion, and my book goes into certain aspects of the Trump presidency that look and feel not only manifestly different, but wrong in an institutional sense, wrong in a sense of norms and expectations. But in every case, that doesn't necessarily mean everything that is different is wrong. I can tell you, having spent 16 months covering the Republican battle for the nomination and then the general election. There were 75 Trump rallies that I attended in that process. There was a hunger in this country for something that was disruptive, that was different. And that in itself became, in ways I'd never seen it before, in a presidential campaign, a kind of force of momentum, disruption, pushing desks over, metaphorically, if 
it were possible, toppling a political structure that a good number of voters told me repeatedly they felt was either indifferent to them or had forgotten them. Now that's an impulse that happens to matter in a functioning democracy. If large numbers of people feel that they are not being listened to or manifestly ignored, that will have a political consequence or repercussion at some point. And that some point came, I think it's fair to say, in 2016. Now what's the book about? The book is about the first 18 months of the Trump presidency. It's not about every aspect of the first 18 months of the Trump presidency. I write at one point in the book that you could genuinely put together a book on each and every month of the first 18 months of the Trump presidency. Enough happened in each of those 18 months, either in terms of accomplishments or successes legislatively or things that didn't happen in all of the various internal fights and reasons why things didn't happen and just the general approach the president took to the presidency itself and all the pushing against our institutional sense of norms, you could put together a book on each and every month. So it's not comprehensive. I don't think there's any way you can comprehensively write about everything that did happen. However, my goal was to take what I regarded as the first and the most important 10 or 11 events of those 18 months, identify them, take my repertorial skills, drill down on them, explain who the key people were, what happened, why it happened, and what that might mean for the future of this particular presidency, our own politics, and where it might fall in terms of historical comparisons to previous presidencies. That was enough for me to try to accomplish. Um, if you are to ask me, if you were to ask me, has anything happened that would fairly be described as either foundational to a Trump legacy or foundational to structural shifts in our politics, I would say yes. Three things at least on domestic policy. The tax cut and changes in the federal tax code are significant. They're the largest in, in several years. It's not the biggest tax cut effort, but it's a significant change in the way we tax corporations, small businesses, and individuals. That will probably be with the country for the next 10 years, if not longer. How that happened and the various rises and falls in that legislative process, I detail in the book. On immigration, we have a completely different approach to enforcement of policy from this administration than we've seen in the last 30 or 40 years. Not only are things enforced differently, and by that I mean enforced to the fullest extent of the law. President Obama introduced the phrase prosecutorial discretion on immigration policy. That meant lighter some places, heavier others. For the Trump administration, prosecutorial discretion means heavy everywhere and the fullest application of existing law. That's a definite change in terms of policy, and there's a definite change in the way we talk about immigration, the way this president talks about it, the blowback from that, and our international reputation on our national attitudes about those who are classified as either refugees or immigrants. That's a significant change. The other place I would say is on the federal judiciary. Two Supreme Court justices already nominated and confirmed under the Trump presidency and a great number of federal appellate court judges nominated and confirmed. I go into great detail in the book about how all of that played into the presidential campaign, the Merrick Garland episode, how Trump took on that issue and with the help of Mitch McConnell, made sure that that vacancy would not be filled, laid that question before the country, put together a list of potential nominees, how that all developed and the political consequences from that. So those are just three areas. I also delve into some issues of international policy, China, Saudi Arabia. If you want a sense of why it's so difficult for this administration to confront the Saudi royal family and how that relationship began during the transition with Jared Kushner, you'll see the only on the record interview he ever, he's ever given on that topic in my book. So I recommend that. So it's not everything, but it's as much as I could get to and as much as I could accomplish in book form while I was doing my day job. Let me emphasize, I wrote this book while I was doing my day job. CBS likes books. Uh, CBS likes to publish books, likes to read books. It just doesn't like its employees to write books, apparently. So I was given all sorts of encouragement in general to write the book, so long as I did that while I did everything else that I was supposed to do. So 
in the grand scheme of things, would I have preferred to have a little bit more time? Yes, but even so, I think it's a forceful retelling of the first 18 months. There's a little bit of the campaign. It says journalistic a treatment uh, of this presidency as I think you'll find. Everything in the book is on the record. Not because I don't believe in off the record sources, clearly I do. I've been in Washington since 1990, they're bread and butter. But I made a choice tactically in putting the book together that as this question of what journalism is, is asked with some ferocity by this president and those who are around him, I wanted to give an answer in public, in book form, and right over there it is. Not because I can only answer that question. Lots of people can answer that question. What is journalism? What is it not? But I wanted at least one aspect of a journalistic rendering of the Trump presidency to exist in real time. That's another reason I wrote the book. Last point I would make about that before we begin our broad conversation is the hard truth for me about this book is though I have a platform, I mean on CBS News is not an irrelevant part of the American media conversation. Though I have my podcast, which is on 45 radio stations around the country, including WCBS here in New York. It's on CBSN, our digital platform. We have a million impressions of that podcast every month. There's a platform beneath me upon which you can build recognition of a product such as my humble book over there. Yet it hasn't sold. This book just sits there on bookshelves. And it sits there on bookshelves for a couple of reasons, I think. One is it doesn't fall into our particularly heavyweight emotional reaction to this time in American politics, meaning it doesn't love on the president and it doesn't relentlessly hate on the president. It is in this place of commercial void. It's in the middle. It's journalistic. It is not driven by opinion. It's not driven by adoration. It's not driven by atavistic hatred. It's driven by the facts and it's driven by journalism. And therefore, it does not reinforce either side. And for me, is exactly what I wanted to do, but it's commercial failure is exactly what I feared would happen. That in these times, a balanced and credible rendering of this unique time in American political history can't quite be digested because we're heavily involved in our own personal and emotional reaction to that. And I would never want to deprive anyone of that emotional reaction. Those are real, they're vital to our political conversation. They will be with us and have repercussions for a long time. So. I have the satisfaction of writing the book and also the dim recollection or realization rather that I've probably written the first book about Trump that doesn't sell. Okay, I'll take that unique role in American history as entirely my own. So let's bring our panel up and we'll have a conversation. We'll make sure to get questions from the audience because I know you came in here just to listen to me or Ed or Howard. As enjoyable as that will be, we'll take questions in a minute, but come on up Ed. Thank you very much, Major. Um, I neglected um, to uh, give the subtitle of your book, uh, which is, of course, The Thrills, Chills, Screams, and Occasional Blackouts of an Extraordinary Presidency. And I'm just wondering, before we start to turn to discuss the book, which we were doing earlier this morning as well, um, could you say a little bit about the, uh, the last you talked about the nine days in May with 2017 in your book, of course, the firing of the FBI director. But if you would say a little more about why you picked those, uh, that description for your so, book. So look, those are all value neutral adjectives. If you take them in their pure definition, you can have a scream and a, a blackout. You can be thrilled. You can be chilled as you might be on a wonderful ride in an amusement park. All those things could be positive. They can also be negative. It all depends on how you approach that experience what you bring to it before, what you come away with it afterwards. When I gave the copy of my book to the president on Air Force One as we were flying back from Iraq on Christmas, day after Christmas, uh, he looked at it and read the subtitle and was thoroughly captivated by it. 
thinking, yeah, well, yeah, there is something extraordinary about this presidency, and it is all those things. Obviously, he took a positive orientation to all of those adjectives. He placed his value judgments on them. Someone else who doesn't like the Trump presidency at all would place a value judgment on those adjectives quite differently. I'm sick and tired of the blackouts. I'm, I'm exhausted by all the screams and the chills and the thrills. I'm worn out. I can't take anymore. Trust me, people stop me in the airport and express that in one way or another. So these are value neutral adjectives for a reason, because part and parcel of covering this presidency, part and parcel of its effect on the national consciousness is people can look at it, the same events, and come away with precisely different, not just factual interpretations, but emotional reactions. And that's one of the reasons I carried the subtitle as, as I did. And also to compare it to what was a conversation I had with my publisher, which the publisher first wanted to call this book Roller Coaster. And I said, if you call this book Roller Coaster, I won't write it, because that is the most hackneyed cliche imaginable about any kind of experience in human life. And then they said, well, what if we play with the, the ride in Disneyland? And I'm like, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, and we start to play it around. And then also, so Mr. Trump, people of some on the, uh, who are sympathetic to the president said, that's disrespectful. You're being disrespectful. You're not calling him President Trump. All right, fine. You can believe that. Let me offer an explanation. During the campaign, and Ed knows this, those in the president's inner circle only referred to him in one way, and one way only, Mr. Trump. Never Donald, never the Donald, never by something that often happens in politics. The candidates, three initials are placed together almost in like an acronym, WJC, William Jefferson Clinton, a W for Bush, something shorthand, an, acronistic, or ac an acronym made out of the initials. That never happened with Trump, ever, ever, ever. Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, always, always, almost like, like almost hypnotized. And they would encourage reporters covering the campaign to also use that particular. Never call him Trump, never call him Donald, but no, just call him Mr. Trump. And so this Mr. Trump is almost like a shorthand that was embedded within the inner circle of Trump organization, Trump campaign. So it's not disrespectful. It's actually using the language of those closest to him when I first started encountering Donald Trump on the campaign back in August of 2015. Thank you. Um, one of the, what's particularly interesting about uh, this book, I think, is that it doesn't focus only on the campaign. Uh, in fact, it focuses primarily on the presidency, but you do talk about the six months of reporting on the campaign. And so in our discussion today, I'd like us to talk about the presidency as well as looking ahead to the coming presidential campaign for which we've seen several candidates already announce or prepare to announce at least um, uh, on, on the Democratic side. But if we could begin, Howard and Ed, with uh, your comments on the issues that are raised in Major Garrett's book, from tax cuts to immigration to the Supreme Court to uh, foreign policy, North Korea, which issues, um, these were the issues that were most significant in the first 18 months of the Trump presidency. Which ones will continue to have a lasting effect from the White House in American politics. Why? Please, Ed. Good morning. First of all, uh, I, I've read a lot of books. Uh, I've been in politics for 50 years. Uh, uh, I have basically read just about every Trump book. Uh, I'm on Fox News, so three quarters of the people that are on Fox News that have written a Trump book have number one bestsellers. Uh, if you would have used the name Roller Coaster and Trump on the Roller Coaster, you'd have been the number one book in the country. <laughs> I've been a, been a fan of Major for many, many years. I've watched his work, and he's superb at everything he ever does. Uh, when he was at Fox, CNN, very few people leave Fox as the lead correspondent to go to the National Journal, but he did because he was exploring his journalistic uh, integrity, which he certainly has. So when I read the book, I didn't actually hadn't heard of the book prior to getting the invitation to come here. I got the book on Monday on my iPad, and I thought, well, I could at least glance at it. I started it Monday and could not put it down. It is the very best book I have ever written, or ever read, not written. Uh, I've only written one and it wasn't very good. Uh, it's the very best book I've read about this Trump administration, both good and bad. He, he dissects it in a way, and I would urge students 
uh, and adults who are here, uh, and some may be the same, to get this book if you really want to get an insight in American politics and why this is working and not working. When Mina and I were teaching a teaching course in the American presidency last semester, I said, the serious question here, of course, the students didn't care about Lincoln or Washington or anything else. All of them talk about Trump. And I said, first of all, we have to, is Trump going to be a one-off? Is this going to be the, the, the celebrity president uh, unique election? Or is this, th this a new wave? And he analyzes a lot of that, uh, the, the, the personality today. So again, I, I'm not, he had no idea I was going to say this, but it is just an extraordinary book. And it's one of those books that when you, and I read all the time, I read a couple of books a month uh, and, and order, unfortunately, a lot more books than I read. But this is, this is a fabulous book. And it give you a real insight to who Trump is, who the people around Trump are, uh, and they're unique, not distinguished, but unique. Uh, and he may be our president for another six years. Uh, and, and I think, uh, uh, I think well, well, we'll talk a little bit about that. The lasting legacy is, is threefold. Uh, you touched a little bit about it. The tax bill obviously uh, has changed dramatically uh, and I think certainly had a, a big effort to make the, move the, the economic recovery forward. A lot of people aren't going to be happy, people, people in New York and elsewhere where they don't get all the deductions that they did once and they have to pay a little more taxes. But it has stimulated corporate America. There's now 7.2 million jobs waiting to be filled uh, in America, uh, uh, according to statistics. Uh, and I think that's a positive. The judicial, uh, from my perspective, was a very important thing because I'm, I'm a real firm believer, having worked in both the House and the White House, uh, and never having been a lawyer, never having worked in the court, that the court is the last beacon. It's kind of the mystery of, as a friend of mine once said to me, you know, uh, it was a close advisor to, to Reagan. I said, why don't you ever come back? Why don't you go to the White House? He said, I'd much rather lay at my beach in Newport Beach and believe the guys in the White House know what they're doing. If I come back here and know that they don't know what they're doing, I, I won't be able to rest as easily on the beach in Newport. Uh, I, I believe the court is very, very important to us and very important to us in America today. And I think to a certain extent, the direction that has been set uh, by Trump fills my, my philosophy. And the third thing that I think is very lasting, uh, uh, we rebuilt, I was part of the Reagan administration, obviously, and we rebuilt the defenses of the country that were broken broken by the Vietnam War and broken by a will of the country. And Reagan and John Tower was chairman of the Armed Services Committee uh, and Cap Weinberger were the three lasting voices that wanted to rebuild the defenses of the country. For the last 30 years, that military has basically gone through much, uh, some good, good for them in the sense that they had the equipment to do what they needed to do. And I think Trump's rebuilding of the Defense Department uh, has been very, very substantial. Uh, I think those right now are the three, the three legacies that, that will last beyond the next two years or four years. Uh, the rest of it, I think, we're going to have to wait and see. And, and, and as a strategist who basically always likes to lay out a game plan, uh, week, two weeks, a month, uh, this, is a, this is a day. I'm like everybody else. I get up and say to my wife, uh, what, what did he say today? What's the tweet? Uh, before I turn on the news, and, and, and it's just like, you know, you're sort of glued to what's happening now. It's, it's in, 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 in a and it's, uh, uh, and as, I, as my wife was watching the Grammys the other night, I said, you know, I don't know a single person on this Grammy until they had named Willie Nelson as the best domestic, whatever, <laughs> at the end of it. I'm a big Willie Nelson fan. I instantaneously order his record. It's one of the worst records he ever made. I mean, it's just an, it's, it's an old voice. It's not, not as good as some of his earlier stuff. It's a different, for those of us that are a little bit older, the world is changing fast and furious. And what allows it to have go fast and furious is the, is the social uh, texts that are out there that everybody, I mean, the, the, the two new young congressmen, uh, congresswomen uh, that basically are the center of attention today could never have gotten the center of attention without social media. Uh, and, I, and I take nothing away from their electing, their elections. I take nothing away from what they're saying. But the fact that, that the congresswoman from Queens is now twice, three times what the speaker gets in, in social media tells you the differences that in the society that we're leading today. So. I, I urge you to basically listen carefully today. Uh, if you ha can get the book, read the book. You learn a lot, and it's always important to learn. So I learned a lot from this book. Thank you, Ed. I was interested to hear you say in your summary of these points that uh, I'm bringing up the courts, taxes, and defense. Um, those three policy areas, of course, were foundational for the Reagan presidency Absolutely. in the first year as well. So um, well, make America interesting continuity. Don't, don't forget, make America of great course. was Reagan's slogan too. Yeah, right. right. Howard. 
Uh, well, I'm going to start with his legacy and then talk about the book a little bit. Um, I actually think that Trump's legacy is um, energizing a generation of people, young kids who didn't like institutions and didn't trust politics and make them finally understand that politics was the only way to get anything done. So uh, for me, of course, Trump's presidency is nothing but pain, uh, mostly pain because I think he's a, a, not a moral leader. And I think that's, uh, he's not inspiring. He inspires hate and anger. And I think that's a very bad thing for the country and a very bad thing for the world. But what he has done and his election did literally, and you know, the right wingers make fun of this, there were grief counseling sessions on most college campuses after Donald Trump won. That was a very important thing because the, most of the 40 seats that we just won in this election were not uh, done by the DNC or the DCCC or all that, although they tried to help. It was done by young kids under 30 years old. 15,000 young women were recruited to run for office for school boards, for city clerks, for county administrators, and a lot of them won. And that would never have happened without Donald Trump. So uh, I think that's his legacy. Um, we'll see. That's the only one we can be sure of. Now, this is what I, I'd like to say. First of all, I commend Major for writing this book um, because I, I teach in a number of uh, places besides Hofstra. And, but the th one thing I, t I, I talk to young people about is uh, the, the notion that you can't really judge presidencies until some long time afterwards. The only experience, I, only uh, people I've ever, only president I've never, never despised as much as Donald Trump turned out to be one of the greatest presidents in American history, which is Lyndon Johnson. I grew up, I was at a 20 something when, the, when he was lying to everybody about the war and then Nixon continued to do so. I was infuriated with him. But if you look back now at what Lyndon Johnson did, he transformed an America, that, uh, America in, very few, in a way that very few presidents have voting rights, civil rights, Thurgood Marshall and the Supreme Court, Medicare, Medicaid, these turned out to be permanent changes in the way that America operates, the way we treat our citizens, both old and young, it was an extraordinary presidency. And the Vietnam War, which was what brought him down as president ultimately, turned out to be have no geopolitical significance whatsoever. There were terrible lives lost, 55,000 Americans and have millions of Vietnamese and Cambodians and Laotians. But the truth is, today, Vietnam is a unified country that happens to be a de facto ally of the United States. So when you look back on it, we were infuriated with Lyndon Johnson. If you look back on his achievements today, he was one of the five or six great, greatest presidents in American history, in, in my view. So. The, the courage that it takes to write a book that is actually going to be 25 years from now, I guarantee you all those bestsellers, nobody's going to, they'll use them to start their wood stoves if they still have them. <laughs> they are. I mean, I, I used to read this crap all the time before. You know, it, it wasn't just Trump's presidency. These kind, this genre has been going on a long time and it, it pisses people off and it gets them all cranked up and there's a bestseller and they disappear. You never hear from these people again and you never hear from the authors again. <laughs> You've actually written something that somebody who's half my age is going to be teaching in 25 years. So just hang around long enough to get the royalties from that and you'll be in fine shape. <laughs> well, um, several points have been raised here, Vader. And um, I wonder if we can pick up on one issue to begin with, which is foreign policy, mm -hmm. um, and in particular, North Korea. And uh, when we talk about the... Uh, the challenge of writing a book when events keep changing. Your book actually does cover the summit meeting uh, from the from June 2018 between President Trump and Kim Jong Un. Right. And uh, I think you go up to July, right? A little yes. bit of what happens after. So as close as you could get, right? But up to print. Of course, now we know that there will be another meeting in Vietnam at the end of the month. I think you mentioned that you'll be, uh, I'll be covering there. that. Yep. Um, could you say a little bit about what your expectations are for what will happen at the summit and maybe from a reporting perspective of how uh, covering this meeting compares to covering other presidents recently in foreign policy, particularly Bush and Obama. Well, North Korea and Trump is in some ways a way to think about, it kind of encapsulates the Trump approach to presidential powers and operating on the world stage in this respect. Uh, certainly, it violates all the norms of what we'd expect a president to say 
publicly via Twitter or even in the well of the United Nations about an adversary and to use social media and use his very own unpredictability as a tool that only he really understands or thinks he understands and that most of his closest advisors, advisors are unnerved about, but not nearly as unnerved about as our allies and those in the region. And in the moments that these things are happening, fire and fury and what the president said in August in Bedminster of 2017, essentially suggesting that a nuclear conflict with North Korea was imaginable and anxiety in Guam about that, anxiety in Hawaii, uh, the reuse of civil defense alarms, the accidental tripping of one of those civil defense alarms. All of this created a sense of anxiety, panic, and unease about what the president intended to do. And then he has the summit, and from his calculus says, so what, we have a summit. So, okay, I give Kim Jong-un a platform, and I give him legitimacy. So what? I don't give up anything. We haven't given up on the sanctions, and maybe we can work something out. That is completely outside of everything that existed before the Trump presidency. Again, this falls into the category of different, necessarily wrong, maybe, maybe not. We don't know. And then after the summit, you have the president declaring it's all solved. And then you have him saying, if it Obama, if someone else had been elected, we'd have gone to war when the most warrior like rhetoric was spoken, not by anyone before his presidency or seeking the presidency, not named Donald Trump, but Donald Trump himself. That gives you an insight. And I use that word gently into the way he thinks about his own rhetoric in that he does not devote a lot of time or energy to remembering what he has said. He only spends a lot of time and energy about what he is about to say. And he will live in a very limber world in relationship to what he has said or what he intends to do. And I write in the book that during the transition, Henry Kissinger met with Jared Kushner and said in ways that he also advised Richard Nixon, use your unpredictability as a tool, particularly in Asia. There's a great sense of, of desire for and appreciation of predictability. And if you are an American who leads this great military and this country and are unpredictable, you might be able to achieve things that you couldn't achieve if you were not. The president has taken that to higher levels of, let's say, flexibility and improvisation than I think even Henry Kissinger would have imagined. And we don't know yet the outcome in North Korea. There was a report this week that I put on my Twitter feed that the North Koreans may, in Vietnam, commit to international inspections of all of their nuclear sites. That was promised after the first summit. It may not come to pass, but it might. If it does, would that not fall into a category of significant achievement? One of the things that I think it's also worth pointing out about North Korea, if you were to take any other president and put these set of facts before the nation on North Korea, take Trump's name out of it, you would possibly find polling more sympathetic to the actual policy achievements. Not unlike, Howard Dean, I think you remember this, when things were described and attributed to President Obama among Republicans with his name taken out, sometimes Republicans say, yeah, I'm in favor of those things. I like those policies. Oh, wait a minute, it's Obama, never mind, forget it. We have this tendency now where names and personalities, and because Quite obviously, President Trump has so hyper-personalized the presidency, he's carrying on a trend line, I want to point out, that the tripwire becomes Trump itself separate from what's actually happening. So North Korea is an evolving story. It, can, it carries on. We don't know where it's all going, but we know there are different things happening, both with their, in Vietnam, there could be a formal end of the war between North Korea and South Korea. That would be no longer an armistice, but an established end of the war on a treaty. Would that not be a good thing? It very well might be. It might be an after effect of this. It might be a consequence of this direct engagement. Again, that is a story that kind of evolves, only is happening because of Trump. Not all of it is a, a linear presentation of either facts or rhetoric, but it's kind of improvisationally happening before our very eyes. So what you asked me, what do I expect in Vietnam? 
what I always expect with the Trump presidency, the unexpected. <laughs> Fair enough. So I want only one thing ahead. I'd add to that. You said that Trump only thinks about what he's going to say and not what he has said. Um, he also always thinks about what someone else said about him. Uh, he, and, and the bottom line here is this has got a very thin skin. And if you basically, it's why half the Republicans are scared to death of him, uh, that he'll go out and attack you. Uh, and I, I've said this before, I did Ross Perot's campaign for eight weeks. And Perot had a movement very similar, uh, but once the attacks came on Perot, he wasn't a fighter like Trump, but he basically got in the fetal position, crawled under the bed, and basically didn't, didn't fight back. This guy loves the fight. He loves the fight. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, he, he doesn't necessarily fight fair. He doesn't necessarily fight uh, by any rules, uh, uh, but he loves the fight. And the one person he's a little afraid of, I think, at this point in time, he will admit that, is Nancy Pelosi, uh, who basically has played him like a Stradivarius over the last uh, <laughs> six, eight weeks. And I've known Nancy for 40 years. I, I both grew up in California. We were opposite each other in politics. And she is one of the most effective leaders. And someday there'll be a there'll be a Pelosi building. And don't worry, there's no building to name right now, but the government will build a building. Uh, and, and there'll be a Pelosi building along with the other prominent speakers because she is, uh, but she's got a real task ahead of her too, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, Howard, I was wondering if I could ask you, I don't know if you want to say anything about foreign policy, but I wanted to ask if we could also talk about, when we're talking about assessing the Trump presidency at midterm, it seems to be major that your term of unpredictability and for, with North Korea illustrates much of what we're seeing with Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. So one area where we do seem to have some predictability, I think at least from this morning's news reports, is that the government will not shut down again. Right. Um, and so as, as we assess the presidency at midterm, it seems to me that that's another area that we should discuss of what, um, and Howard, if you want to start with foreign policy, that's fine, but if you'd also like to say something about what this, what the five-week government shutdown has meant for the White House and for White House executive uh, legislative cooperation. Um. You know, I'm not one of those who condemned the uh, Democrats that condemned the North Korea trip. Uh, you know, when you have a policy that for 60 years it doesn't work, uh, other things are worth trying. Um, I don't, uh, obviously the president said a lot of things about the summit that didn't happen and weren't true and so forth, is the usual baggage. But I think the meeting was worth it, um, even if nothing happens. Um, because we weren't going anywhere with that and, and North Korea clearly has nuclear weapons and the question is, uh, there was actually a debate, uh, a quiet debate going on um, before Trump or not among both Republicans and Democrats about whether we should just uh, give up on the notion that we were going to uh, disarm uh, Kim Jong-un of nuclear weapons. I suspect that debate is probably still going on uh, well away from the White House where you can't have debates unless you want to see him on Twitter the next morning. So. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not a fan of the unexpected. I think uh, unexpectedness has advantages, Nixon with the madman theory. Uh, but the problem is uh, diplomacy is different than foreign policy. When Trump was elected, I never worried that it was going to wreck the American economy because Washington doesn't run the American economy. The American economy is run by 50 million businessmen who, in, who collectively make decisions, or businessmen and women who collectively make decisions every day, and then the chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve Board. And the Washington relative has relatively little to do with it. And I even think these tax cuts are really not, have not stimulated the economy. They stimulated out of stock buybacks and the money went to the wrong place. If you want to stimulate the economy, forgive student loans. That's $1.7 trillion. It will go right back into the economy and get spent. But I digress. Um, yes, but I digress. So I'm not willing to, I mean, I, I think we really do have to be rational about what we think is going on. I don't think the president is rational, but that doesn't mean that his, his actions are gonna have consequences. He's the president of the United States, and I'm not entirely sure what the consequences of, of the North Korea approach are, but I'm willing to wait and see what the consequences are, because uh, as long as we, uh, as nobody gets stupid and says something really stupid, which is always a possibility, we're not gonna have a war. And that's the thing that you have to absolutely avoid. The rest of it is a situation that's not stable, despite the fact that we have troops in South Korea and have had for decades. Um, and if it could be stable, that would be something better. It's the same reason I, I oppose Trump uh, attacking the Iran nuclear deal. That was a situation that was made more stable and now we've made it unstable. So it couldn't cut both ways. Um, 
What was the second part of the question? Well, I moved over to the government shutdown. So the I government <laughs> shutdown. I, look, I, I, this is all drama. Look, Trump's, Trump, Trump's major task, as he sees it in the morning every day, is to get up and make sure people are talking about him. And they really don't care what they're saying about him. He just wants to be the lead story. And so the government shutdown is all drama. And, he, and I th really think the reason it's no, not going to be a government shutdown is because the Republicans got their butts kicked so badly in the terms of the polls that quietly McConnell and the few people that do have a good relationship with Trump and aren't just terrified of him all the time went to him and said, if you do this, you're probably not going to get reelected. And we're certainly not going to get reelected. And that'll be the end of the judge parade onto the Supreme Court. And that's why there's not going to be a government shutdown. You could have put spaghetti in that bill and Trump would have signed it. And he's already out telling us. His, his, uh, his, his people that we've already built most of the wall, and this is the money we need to build the rest of it. I mean, this is bupkis, as they say in the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> two, two quick comments. One, one it was very important on, on the Korean visit. For the first time in, in since the split, the South Korean government is very pro, President of South Korea is very pro-North. And I thought it was very important for us to step in there and basically continue our role as, as a key player. Uh, and that's kind of quieted down a little bit. Uh, uh, and there are always consequences on that. And, and eventually, you know, maybe my, not in my lifetime, but maybe eventually they'll come back together again. It probably won't be with, with uh, it won't be what we want. It'll be what, what they want. But that was very important, I think, at this point in time. The second, on the, on the shutdown, I, I've, I've lived, I, I first went to Washington in 1973 in the Nixon administration. And every year the budget was always a big debate. And there were always Christmas Eve votes on Social Security because it was the most expensive item, what have you. And they did the whole Budget Reconciliation Act, which was to change how we do budgets because they didn't want to be voting on Social Security recipients on Christmas Eve. So they moved the fiscal year from June 30th to October. Uh, it hasn't worked, and it needs to be redone again. And I think the process itself sucks, and it really needs to be redone. And we should never penalize uh, the American workers. Uh, but it, the thing that to me is ironic is when you have a director of OMB, uh, I guess he's permanent director of OMB, part-time acting chief of staff yeah. in the White House, who basically says for the first time, deficits don't matter. As we hit the $20 trillion mark yesterday, I find it astonishing. Uh, I find it equally astonishing that he takes three congressmen, goes up to Camp David, uh, and the new chairman of the Budget Committee says, if Trump wasn't president and Mick Mulvaney was president, we could get things done. I assume they're looking for a new chief of staff uh, in the White House today. Uh, at least will be shortly. Uh, they always are. They always are. <laughs> I, I just have to say one thing. For when Mulvaney said that, he now agrees with Stephanie Kelton, who's a great economist, who was actually Bernie Sanders' economist in the last round. So you've got Mick Mulvaney of the Tea Party and Stephanie Kelton in the same view of economics. Deficits don't matter. And, and, and Dick Cheney. Don't forget Dick Cheney said they didn't matter. Um, Peter Oder, if you'd want to comment on the, well, what the, the effect the, of this the, the, There won't be another was. shutdown. The president will sign it. And... Um, if, for all the reasons that Howard Dean mentioned, and another one that I think is also important. Um, the reason the shutdown ended on the terms that it did, meaning the president got nothing out of it, uh, was that for the first time, those within his inner circle who were actually monitoring the levers of our systems that were not being funded during the partial government shutdown came to him and said, Mr. President, if you carry this forward, these systems, which are beginning to buckle, there will be a system failure. Something will happen at an airport or some other security facility or something is going to go wrong and you're going to own all of that, not just the politics of it, you're going to own the system failure. And that message finally, after being communicated in a, a number of different meetings over a number of different days, resonated sufficiently. And then there was another factor, which kind of goes to some of the observations that Ed made. Oh, the president loves the fight. He also loves the stage. Um, as Howard said, he likes to be the center of the story. I quote in my book, Corey Lewandowski saying on the record, Trump hates negative press unless he generates it. <laughs> it's kind of an insight. So when the president had to reconcile himself to the actual institutional power of the House of Representatives to set the terms of a State of the Union address, and that institutional power was not checkable by the presidency. It's usually a pro forma thing. You don't even know that there had to be a resolution passed by the House and Senate to have a State of the Union. How did you learn that? Because the House denied the president access. The House said no. 
You can't come here. We will lock the doors. And there is nothing you at the President of the United States can do to open them. Not one thing. What did that tell the country? It told the country a couple of things that I think, to Howard's earlier point about what is one of the legacies of the Trump presidency, we now have a much more lively conversation in our country about our institutions. How are they populated? What are their powers? How do they structurally align with one another? What is their underlying purpose? And how vital and valid are they to our overall political experience? I'm not looking for a silver lining. I'm not asking you to look for a silver lining. I'm just saying that's one of the things that's happened. This institutional sense of what are they? How do they function? That played out in the terms of whether or not there'd be a State of the Union. And the president thought about giving a rally someplace else as an alternative venue. But then he said, wait a minute. That's one network covering that, not all of them. It's not the well of the house. It's not whatever that number of millions will tune in. I'm not giving that stage up. So I have to retreat. And part of that retreat fed into his retreat on ending the partial government shutdown. I want the stage. I can only get the stage if I end the shutdown. Institutional powers mattered. They ran up against the presidency and the presidency had to acknowledge them. The president said, I can't get there. I want inside. How do I get inside? Got to end the shutdown. This is another legacy uh, issue that we, we didn't talk about is um, Trump is testing the institutional, the, the, the checks and balances system as it hasn't been tested since I think maybe even Jackson saying, well, Justice Marshall has made his decision. Now let him, let him enforce it. Um, and, the, you know, these institutions haven't been used a lot. Uh, they were we brought them out during Watergate and the Supreme Court voted nine to nothing that Nixon couldn't withhold the tapes. That was significant in terms of checks and balances. But this is the first time we've used a lot of the systems ever. There was never a discussion about the about who was going to give the space, uh, the uh, the State of the Union and when. Now, that's a small matter relative to some of the really big stuff that's going on. But I think part of part of Trump's legacy, and we don't know what this is going to be, is, is we tested our checks and balances system and our institutional uh, design of the Constitution, which was designed so the president couldn't run over Congress. And did it work? Well, we're going to find that out. Either way, that's going to be a legacy of the Trump administration. Um. Before we move to questions, I, I, we've raised so many issues about policy and, and the Trump presidency, and I almost hesitate to go back to campaign mode in a non-national election year. But, um, but with so many candidates on the Democratic side having declared and so much discussion of what, of what is coming in 2020, I think some comparison to 2016 is helpful. Um, Major, you covered the uh, 2016 campaign for 16 months. I think I saw that you attended or wrote about, uh, uh, reported on 75 Trump rallies. And I believe in one of the interviews about your book last fall, you said that one of um, Trump's strengths was that he talked beneath his audience, mm -hmm. not above his audience or to his audience, but beneath his audience. And I think I have the quotation here. He lifted people up and made them feel smarter. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you could say, because that really resonated, um, as, as could you say a little bit about what that experience, what you saw uh, in 2016, whether you see that happening in 2020, and what Democratic, whether Democratic candidates will be able to do the same. And then I'm hoping that Ed and Howard will comment on that as well. I don't know if Democratic candidates will be able to do the same. Um, and I don't think uh, President Trump will be able to do it in the way he did it in 2016. There was something so unique about this. And I, and I heard the, the what I hope were appreciative laughs out there. I'm not quite <laughs> sure, but I'll take them uh, in. I'll take them on board as appreciative laughs uh, until you tell me otherwise. This idea of talking beneath a crowd and making them feel smarter, making them feel not only what every political actor attempts to do, which is win the room, that's a key, taking people from a certain place of either neutrality or nominal support to ferocious, really enthusiastic support. That's, everyone does that in politics, or at least attempts to do that. What I saw in, in the Trump rallies over and over and over again is that not only did Trump have this sort of very common language, everyone talked about that, and you would hear incessantly on cable, he's tapped into something. Okay, yes, what? 
I can't give you the what, but I can give you a sense of the how. That people would not just nod, but they would say to themselves, and I would watch this happen in their rallies, I've been saying that for 20 years. <laughs> All right? My common wisdom expressed at the dinner table, in the living room, at the pub or wherever, is now revealed wisdom of this person who is now winning primaries, caucuses, may win the nomination, is the nominee, could be president. I mean, this sense that, and again, one thing that's important about evaluating politics is whether you agree or disagree, that's an important part of the conversation. But that something succeeds, even if you disagree, you need to take time to understand possibly why it succeeded, because that's how you learn how to counter it, if you feel politically motivated to counter it. And one of the problems I sometimes have in conversations about this presidency is people assume if I say something that Trump has done that has gone well, I am praising him or I am embracing him. No, I'm just telling you what I saw and that it worked matters in a conversation, not just about tactics, but what's happening and what may happen in the future. Can he win again? So this idea that a common wisdom expressed by someone in an uncommon way, an unexpected way, reached so many people, mattered not just to Trump, not just to his tiny, tiny campaign team, but it mattered immensely to the people who responded to it. They felt attached in a level, of an emotional level that they hadn't felt before, about politics generally or about a political candidate individually. That has relevance. It's also one of the things, to double back if I can, just briefly to the shutdown that's relevant, in that as a political actor, Trump has a relationship that's symbiotically, emotionally attached to these supporters. He doesn't want to walk away from them. I quote in the book Bob Corker, then the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Republican from Tennessee, saying of Trump, he is terribly afraid of his base in that he never wants to disappoint it. And that's why a year ago, when there was $25 billion on the table for the wall, and a DACA deal that he was willing to accept, he didn't because he was afraid of this base. So to Ed's point, he loves to fight, but he doesn't always fight strategically. The bill he's going to sign today gives him the least amount of available money he's ever been offered on border barriers, the least amount. So he has literally bargained himself to the lowest point offered on border barrier funding. You know, the, 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 yeah, art of the deal. He has literally bargained himself to the worst, most vulnerable position on that and has no other alternative. That's a lack of strategic sense about these things. But part of it is related to this, not only political, but emotional attachment to people who respond to him so fervently. And that sense that he loves the rally and the rally tells him he's on the right track. And that's basically his metric, that I'm on the right track. You're there, I'm here, isn't this great, we're all good. Even though, as Ed was pointing out earlier, or, or implying, that's not, A, the whole electorate, and that may be a, a, a potentially dangerous misreading of his setup for 2020. He, he has an ability to rationalize. It'd be like if you're going to the Congress and you needed one more carrier, it cost $10 billion, $11 billion. And the Congress said, no, we're going to give you a rowboat. Uh, and you say, in a week, you'd be saying, that's exactly what I wanted. Who needs a big carrier that's going to cost $10 billion when I can have a rowboat and fight with drones uh, just as effectively? He has a great ability to rationalize. Uh, and, and, uh, and I don't think you should ever underestimate that. Normally, when you get clobbered in a White House, which I've been in some when you get clobbered, uh, or you lose an election, or you basically analyze an election, you sort of make adjustments. Uh, uh, there's no adjusting here. It's a total rationalization. Uh, and, and I think to a certain extent, uh, as you say about his base, which I'm quite familiar with his base, uh, these are the guys who sit at the end of a bar and, and say, and all have opinions, all yell at the TV set, what, what do those jerks know? Uh, and, and we all know them. Uh, it's, it's not in the intellectual centers of, of America or California, or New York or elsewhere. Could this president win a popular vote? Absolutely not. Could this president win an electoral vote again with multiple candidates running on the Democratic side? And maybe a third candidate certainly can't. And anybody that underestimates that is a fool. Howard. Thank you. 
um, 2020 election? Please. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm optimistic, but I'm always optimistic, of course. Um, I do think Trump could get reelected um, if we screw it up, and we certainly have a history of doing that in the past. Um, we've got, we've, I, 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 my own personal preference is that we have somebody who's younger. I want somebody who's 50, or I'd love somebody who's in their 40s, because our core base is young people, uh, people of color, and women. And when they turn out, we win. When they don't turn out, if you don't give them a reason to, they won't and we'll lose. And if you look at the last, the eight years that Obama was in power, young people actually elected Barack Obama by their enormous turnout. It was the only time in my lifetime where more people under 35 voted than over 65. Uh, then they went away in 2010 because Obama wasn't on the ballot and we got clobbered. We lost 63 seats. They came back in 2012 and Obama beat Romney by, I don't know, several points. I can't remember what the margin was. And then, uh, and then we got clobbered again in 2015. Now they came out in 2000. 2018 was the first congressional election. The young people have really come out and we elected a, a base that looks like us. We elected women, young people, and people of color. That's who went to Congress, and that's who went to the Virginia Assembly in, in 2017. So we, if we, 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 I think the days that two white guys are gonna be at the top of the Democratic Party ticket are gone forever, and if we do it, we're gonna lose. But you know, we don't have, I don't have control over that. We're gonna, voters are gonna nominate somebody. There are a lot of good candidates. Uh, I know a lot of them. Um, I'm probably just gonna not endorse anybody just to see what the voters wanna do, and they'll tell us. Uh, it'll, it'll be a long, uh, a long drawn out. My prediction is after the first four, Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada, there are going to be four or five viable candidates, which is a lot. Usually that's not the way it is after the first four. Don't forget California. Uh, California. Then, we're, then we're going to California. And Texas. Um, and Texas. And Nevada. And Michigan. And no, no, wait a minute. That was a different speech. <laughs> Well, the past is always present. <laughs> so then, so then the, the interesting thing about California is it's actually a trap for Kamala Harris because if Kamala Harris doesn't win California, she's in really big trouble. If she does win California, that's going to help her a lot. But people are going to say, well, you know, she's from California. What do you expect? So it's very interesting. I don't have any idea who we're going to nominate because I don't know. I've never seen most of these candidates except for the older, the septuagenarians, the Bernie, Elizabeth, and, um, and Joe Biden, most of them have never run for president before. So it, unless you see them under fire, you don't know. One, I don't, I've never met Beto O'Rourke. I was interested in him because he seems to have an, an it factor. I had an insider who I really respect, who's really smart, tell me the other day I ought to keep an eye on him. And maybe, you know, he's the, might be the one to turn on young people. I thought Stacey Abrams' uh, performance at, at the State of the Union was unbelievable, was at, at least as good, if not better, than any of the people who were running for president. I don't know if she's going to run, but somebody's better think about her. So we have no idea. This is a, a revolution of the young. It's, this, this business about right versus left in the Democratic Party is all crap from the press. What's well, because people are get very excited about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I think she's great, but she's not exact. She doesn't represent any of the kind of candidates that we got elected in, in, in Pennsylvania and all those places. I mean, those are moderate Democrats. This is not right versus left. This is old versus young. And the young are going to win one way or the other. And what I tell the Democrats is they're going to win because our telomeres can't be long, lengthened. They can only be shortened. And we're, we're all going to die. So you can do it the easy way or the hard way. They're going to push you out or you can coach them as they come in. But they need to be the face of the Democratic Party young people, people of color, and women. That is the face of the Democratic Party for the next, for, for the lifetimes of most of these young people who are voting now, for the lifetimes, that's gonna be the base. Coincidentally, it happens to look like what the country's gonna look like. Since, since, since Howard brought it up, I was in the dance hall in Des Moines, <laughs> and I was asked immediately <laughs> after that presentation what it was like, and I said, well, Governor Dean was slightly more enthusiastic than the room. <laughs> I was trying to bring them up. And, and he, he and I have had this conversation. There's, there's a great dissection of what the room sounded like right. as, composed to what it, as compared to what it sounded like on television. And he was just slightly more enthusiastic than the room. The room was crazy enthusiastic. It just, in the particular world of television, had a certain 
memorable effect. But all I said at the time was you were slightly more enthusiastic than Thank the room. Thank you, Major. I appreciate it. I'm going to buy four copies of your book now. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I have to say that, um, Howard, in, oh, yeah, sure. But anyway, in many years of discussing, sorry, of uh, the panels, that, that uh, 2000, uh, that has come up only a handful of times, and I wasn't expecting it and today. I've, I've, brought, I've brought it up every chance I get. <laughs> Go ahead, and then we'll open questions, please. Howard is not in any way, shape, or form incorrect on the future of the Democratic Party uh, or the future of the country. It's just right now the perception of what these young people, Democrats are moving left and will move further left. You're not, what, a, what a traditional centrist, uh, Walter Mondale, who was a liberal to me, but what the perception of him is, is not, and, and we don't know what's going to happen. You've got, you've got right. an extraordinary number of candidates out there running. Uh, uh, as we found out uh, two years ago, uh, and, and I remind you, the last two people who were elected president had never run for president before and certainly were not expected to be president, uh, Barack Obama, or, or there's no inevitability this time. Uh, twice, Hillary Clinton was the inevitable nominee of the Democratic Party. Uh, last time it was probably Jeb Bush or, or one of the others that was inevitable early on. Uh, the American electric basically and the powers of television and social media and the way you campaign is dramatically different today. And what are the issues in a year? We don't know. Uh, and I think to a certain extent, uh, uh, I'm not in any way, shape or form dumping on your candidates. Uh, but I think there's always, as I've always said, it's like a game of, and I've said it here, a game of two-handed poker. Your pair of twos may not look like much, but they beat one of a kind. This is a cycle, and this is a, if you have the guts to hold the cards, this is a cycle in which you think I'm bad, look at the other guys. Uh, that may be the, you know, that may be the strategy here. Uh, if you think Trump's terrible, look at those guys. And I think that's, that's what we don't know how that's gonna play out. Well, I think on that note, we should open to some discussion of both the policy and the politics. Um, we have several students and guests in the audience. We'd like to have a combination of questions. And so we would like to begin uh, with a student question, if possible. So we're going to give students a couple of seconds to come up, if they will. Uh, can you come up to the microphone, please? And. Uh, and let's try to keep the questions short so we can incorporate as many as possible. And again, we're going to try to get in a few student questions and we'll try to incorporate as many as we can. Please, go ahead. Hi. I know we were just talking about um, how the parties have sort of changed and um, what the Democratic Party is going to look like. Um, Trump is unconventional among Republicans. So I guess I wanted to ask how... What is the Republican Party going to look like now that we have this figure that we've, we've never seen before? Like, is the cohesiveness of partisanship as we know it diminishing? Like, what are the parties going to look like in the 2020 election? For both parties. Yeah, that's yeah. anybody's guess. I mean, the, the, the reality is Trump, Trump is, is now viewed as the Republican Party. He never was a Republican uh, before, uh, he, as, as you say so well in your book. There are many of us who liked the Republican policies, and he ended up being the nominee, and, and we supported him. Uh, he obviously has turned out to be quite different than I think a lot of us assumed, uh, uh, good or bad. Uh, and, and I think it's hard at this point in time to say both parties have been flexible, both parties have moved. Uh, Republican Party is down to the most significant base. It was an element that wasn't even in our party 40 years ago, was the religious right. The religious right is 25 percent of the electorate. It's the strongest base we have. They voted for Jimmy Carter in 1976. In 1980, they voted a little bit for Reagan. In 1984, overwhelmingly for Reagan. Uh, they never had ownership of the party. They now have ownership of this party. If, if for any reason uh, uh, Trump did not have the religious right, uh, uh, he would not be a viable candidate for anything. Uh, they're there. Uh, Democrats historically have had African Americans, younger voters, labor. Uh, a lot of those elements change in the course of the candidate, uh, uh, the campaign. And I think the key thing here is can you basically, with a 25 or 20, say there's only 20 people run, uh, are you going to get the media attention you got the last time? Is someone going to emerge from that as the candidate, which Trump did? Uh, Trump dispatched a whole lot of very significant Republicans the last go around, uh, starting with Jeb Bush and Mark, I mean, just go right through the list. Uh, through major efforts of Fox News that basically had, uh, had adopted Trump. And no one I don't think is ever going to get $5.8 billion in free, ever, free television time again. Uh, so, uh, and I think, I think that had a giant impact. 
But at the end of the day, you know, a year from now, when we sit here and discuss where we're going, uh, uh, you're going to basically have uh, two, three. I, I worry about, I go back to the point, I worry about third and fourth candidates getting into this mix. And as I've said here before, I don't think anyone's going to get 50% of the vote again in the foreseeable future. There's always going to be extra people running. And so it really comes down to kind of electoral kind of strategy. You're never going to, Demo Democrats never going to lose California, never going to lose New York. Uh, but you're never going to win Mississippi or Alabama, those states too. They're much smaller. But at the end of the day, as you saw when, when Trump drew the inside straight this last go around, this game plan has been the exact game plan that every Republican strategist has had. But we couldn't get Wisconsin, we couldn't get Michigan. Uh, and can we get them again? That's, that's the key here. So, so I, I say two things in the book uh, about this question. Um, at the very tail end of the book in the epilogue, I say that Republicans look upon Trump as if they are in the presence of a strange new political force and they don't know what to do. Some of that is fear, some of it is just, he changed the rules and politicians spend a lot of time for completely rational and logical reasons, understanding the rules and maximizing their ability to function within those rules. A rule breaker is someone that they have a sense of anxiety about and they don't challenge Trump and they also know in the fractious primary atmospherics of Republican Party politics going up against Trump puts you in more danger. And if you want to avoid danger, you go along with Trump, though you may not do so enthusiastically or with a mountain of press releases and press conferences, you just quietly go along. The other thing I say in the book, and I think this is an important part of the 2016 process, I come up with a metaphor of a lottery ticket. I have a chapter in the book titled Lottery Ticket. And I think that is something that is possibly useful in thinking about a not heavily aligned Trump voter. If you look at the political system in much the way people who purchase lottery tickets look at the economic system as it's there, but I don't have 100% faith in it, and I'm willing to take a chance, so I'll buy a lottery ticket, knowing that the mathematical odds don't work in my favor, I'll still do it anyway. I do think there was a lottery ticket aspect to Trump. Trump is different, Trump can't be bought, Trump is not from the system, I'll take a chance. I'll buy my lottery ticket and see what happens. I met a lot of Trump supporters who fell generally into that category. And I would say for them, if there was one issue that pushed them over into the purchasing of that lottery ticket was the future of the Supreme Court. I don't think there's any question about that and the polling data backs that up. So I can't give you an answer on what is the future of partisanship in the Trump Republican Party and is Trump the Republican Party? On my show last week, I had newly elected Senator from Florida, Rick Scott, I said, is Trump good for the Republican Party? I thought it was a very simple question. Long pause. Long pause. This guy just got elected with Trump's endorsement. Uh, well, he won Florida. That was Rick Scott's answer. I'm like, yeah, I know. Is he good for the Republican Party? Very strange. Not really sure how to come to grips with that answer. I think that is in itself illustrative of this conflict Republicans have with He's there, he's president. We are really not in a position to either contest that and it harms us politically to try to contest it, but what do we do with it? I, think, I still think that process is evolving. Howard, any comment on the, what this means for the Democratic side as far as uh, bringing the part, what the implications are for the well, party? Well, you know, as I said before, I think we're sort of going, uh, 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 going through a gentle revolution and a generational change in the Democratic Party. And that's going to be fought out in the primaries. Um, there are a lot of candidates. Uh, I'm not so worried as I was. We have a debate process, which I was already chastised for sharing in public once, so I'm not going to do it again. But it's, it's, we looked at what went wrong in the Republican debate system, uh, and we're going to try to fix that, um, although we obviously have to let everybody have a stage for at least a while, because uh, debates are important. They actually expose to interested voters, which are the most important kinds in the, in the primaries, uh, all the candidates nobody's ever heard of. I, I'm pretty sure that the, our, can, our nominee is going to be somebody most people haven't heard of. I mean, they've heard of him now because they're all announcing. But say a, a month and a half ago, I, I would have bet you that our candidate is not going to be somebody with national name recognition right now. Um, and that's happened, of course, happened before. Whoever heard of Barack Obama or Jimmy Carter? Um, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm just... I'm not worried. I, the only thing I would worry about is if there was really bad infighting, which is not impossible, um, or if there were 
um, such disarray in the process that uh, the message of the party got confused. And, and the message, it cannot be Trump is an idiot. The message has to be, here's what we're going to do. Trump is going to supply the, that part of the message every day. He's going to remind the people who can't stand him that they can't stand him. We do not and should not talk about Donald Trump. This, this election is going to be about Donald Trump, as the last election in 2018 was. It is going to be about Donald Trump. We need to be filling in the blanks. It can't be the lesser of two evils. We need to have a program for this and a program for that. It doesn't have to be greatly detailed. We have to say what we stand for. We do not... One of the advantages of having a candidate who has to be in the news every single day is every day, everybody who doesn't like Donald Trump is going to be reminded that they don't like Donald Trump. We have to have a credible alternative. One of the candidates I really wanted to see in the race who's not in is Chris Murphy, who's 48 years old from Connecticut on the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, very deeply committed. He's got dignity and he's got presence. And I knew he wasn't going to take Trump's bait. If you take Trump's bait, you lose. And he knows it. Thank you. In the interest of time, I think we'll ask for every uh, questioner to direct it to one person on the panel. We'll try to get through as many as we can. Go ahead here, and then we'll go over there. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Sarah. I'm a double major in uh, Can you speak just a little louder? I'm hi. Uh, my name is Sarah Baum. I'm a freshman here at Hofstra. I'm a double major in public policy and in journalism. Um, and so naturally, I'd want to direct my question to uh, Major Garrett. Um, so kind of going back to something that you had talked about before, about the journalistic aspects of the modern political climate in your book, as someone going into this field as a young person, um, you know, I've felt very challenged and intimidated by the prospect of our leaders who are supposed to be reliable sources of information instead often spewing out misinformation, if not outright lies. Um, and some have argued that even that giving a platform to this, even if you're fact checking it live, like side by side, right. um, broadcasting these lies, such as broadcasting these lies, uh, actually promotes them. So, as a journalist, how are we supposed to cover lies, and how are we supposed to make sure uh, that we are responsibly reporting these things and not just further spewing out misinformation? Right. The lie beat. How do you handle the lie beat? Um, so. <laughs> Um, that's, that's a glib response to a very serious question. And um, here's my answer. The country created by the process that we are respectful of and invested in, the 45th president of the United States, whose name is Donald Trump, who says things that are factually inaccurate repeatedly. That's a truth, all right? If you cover the president, you are duty bound to write down that which the president says. What the president says matters. If the president says something that is incorrect, that also matters, and you are duty bound to correct that, or at least provide the best available verified information that challenges that which the president said. Donald Trump's not the first president to lie. Let's be candid about that. He's not the first president to lie and other presidents have lied about other very big things. Howard Dean made a reference to that earlier with Lyndon Johnson. The thing he lied about was a very big thing, an ongoing hot war in Southeast Asia. And knowingly and repeatedly, the Pentagon and the President of the United States lied about the direction of that war, okay? For a period of time, Ronald Reagan lied about Iran-Contra. For a period of time, Richard Nixon lied about Watergate. Uh, the obligation of journalists at any time is to not fall for them, to be on guard, to inform the public, and then let the public figure it out. Our job is not to lead the public to its revealed truth. Our job is to tell the public that which is factually verifiable under the time pressures, and limitations of daily journalism, which is now more often not daily journalism, but hourly journalism, and then let the public decide. We are not arbiters and we are not lecturers. We are vessels and that's it. And I take a very modest approach to my role in American life. The public decides what to do. I tell them as best as I can what's happened and why and what might happen in the future. I reported two and a half days ago that Trump was gonna sign this bill. 
Lots of other reporters were on, we don't know, we don't know, we don't know. I felt perfectly confident that he would sign it based on the people I talked to whom I trusted. I turned out to be right. That doesn't always happen, but I try to make sure that it happens far more often than not. And then that's it, and I back away. And the reason I back away is not only because the role of journalist is not to lead people to your convicted sense of what the truth is, because that's not my obligation, it's not my job, it's not even something I'm entitled to do. But it also goes back to a very simple belief that I have about the relationship between journalism and politics, and it's this. Credible journalism, and I emphasize credible, meaning verifiable, real, penetrating journalism will always outlast incredible politicians. Thank, Thank you. you. Sarah, great question. Yeah. Talks in here. Okay, thanks. Um, we have less than five minutes. If we get quick questions, we'll try to get a couple more in. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, looking forward to the coming campaign, uh, Democrats have been presented uh, over the last few days with the so-called Green New Deal. Um, now, Trump, in his closing argument uh, the other day in El Paso, spoke about Democrats slash socialism slash Green New Deal, relating all of them and indicating that uh, he probably wants to run against Democrats and socialism in the campaign to come. Now, historically, when far-right demagogues, uh, God forbid I should ever characterize Trump that way, but when far-right demagogues uh, run against uh, socialism or communism, um, they tend to win. Uh, think Europe 1930s, think Juan Perón, just like a comment on that. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not worried about that. I, I mean, if you, you look at the polling numbers for young people, socialism is not a loaded negative word. So, and if socialism is a negative word, it's probably, those people are gonna probably vote for Trump anyway. So I think it's a good point to bring up. We could do some more polling research on it. I, and, and it is the, what political parties do is cast their other, their opponents in the most negative possible light. And by the way, if you think Trump is outrageous. This is something Trump did not invent. The, the campaigns of, of the 1800s and the mid early 1900s were far worse than anything Donald Trump ever said. I mean, just some of the, what some of these folks said is just just beyond the pale. They couldn't win today. So, um, but I, I'm not worried about red baiting because I think the the memory of that is. Uh, only exists in, in older people, and those folks are not our base. Thank you, Howard. Um, I think, go ahead, quick, quick question, and we'll try to get one more in, too. Go ahead, please. Major, yeah. you emphasized the word facts. The Ringling Brothers Barnum & Bailey Circus has enclosed. It simply has moved into the White House on the halls of Congress. This voter looks in astonishment at how I believe most in the GOP, and you mentioned this before, you alluded to this before, have sold themselves out to Donald Trump to get something. And at the same time, Donald Trump, in my view, is the poster child for the word insecurity. You are on the inside. You speak with each person in a position of power, and you may even get insights into their core thinking and beliefs. Thus, behind closed doors, they must leak their true beliefs and feelings. What do those in the Republican Party really think about Donald Trump? And are they fearful of losing the White House in 2020 with, as per this week's Real Clear Politics averages, only 43% of America approve of his presidency? And let me just say, Major, before you answer, that's going to be the last question. I'm sorry to my colleagues, but we're out of time, so this will be the last question, please. So sure, there's anxiety about that. Um, and the question is almost existential for Republicans, what to do and how to do it. And they, I don't even be, think they have begun to grapple with that, what to do and how to do it. If you want to worry about the Trump campaign in 2020, um, what is its infrastructure? How much does it raise? It raises a lot of money, actually. Um, are you going to be, if you're a Republican, 
part of the machinery that makes that succeed? Or are you going to just sort of watch and see what happens? Say you're nominally supportive, but not really pitch in. I think a lot of Republicans are trying to struggle with that very concept. Even, and the, the reason I asked Rick Scott uh, about whether Trump was good for the Republican Party is he won in the midterm with the Trump reality all around him in a very competitive state, not just for governor's races or Senate races, but it will clearly be competitive in 2020. Three weeks before that, I had Mike Braun on my show. Mike Braun is Republican Senator from Indiana. I asked him what the president's relationship to the truth was, kind of related to the question before. Another deep, long pause and a heavy sigh. Well, he's always been truthful with me. Okay. Exactly how many conversations have you had since you've been in the Senate for four days now with the president of the United States? <laughs> This hesitancy to, to, to take on what are elemental questions, elemental questions in life and certainly elemental questions in politics. Is the leader of my party good for the party? Okay, that's not a hard one. What's my leader of my party's relationship to the truth? Shouldn't be a hard one, you know, flexible like it is in most, most political conversations, but not injuriously flexible. Well, they can't answer either of those questions with any sort of surety. Another thing that happened to me recently, I did, uh, for what's known as book notes on C-SPAN, a long, hour-long interview with Governor Christie about his new book. At one point, this is all on television, it's remarkable. I asked Governor Christie, I said, what is it that you would say is most important about President Trump's interpersonal relationships? And Governor Christie said on camera, Donald Trump is most disloyal to the people who are most loyal to him. This is not a green room conversation with 17 layers of off the record guarantees that he would say this to me and it would never be repeated. This was said on television. To which I said, well, it's always struck me covering politics that loyalty is kind of a big deal. That you need this sense of, within your inner circle, a sense of confidence in one another. Governor Christie said, well, yeah, but there's lots of other things that are involved in politics, how well you can give a speech, how personally persuasive you are, what kind of judgment you make, how you analyze data. I said, yeah, I agree with you. I've seen all of that play out. But doesn't that have to exist within a vessel of trust and loyalty? Long pause, yes. To which I said to him, all right, Governor, having heard what you just said, the President of the United States is most disloyal to the people who are most loyal to him. Is that sustainable? Another long pause. Answer, no. It's not. When do the, when, what is the timeline of that no? I don't know. Is it a year? Is it six months? Is there some breakage? Is there some point where that interpersonal defect, which I would say it is in politics, becomes intolerable? I don't know. Well, I think we know what your next book project is going to be. We just don't know when it'll be coming up. Please join me in thanking our panelists for a very instructive discussion. And if you'd like to see Major Garrett's book, Mr. Trump's Wild Ride, it's available here. Thank you, everyone.